All right, I am going to kick this off. Um, welcome to the fourth CYBP uh, webinar. Um, we are very excited to have uh, two terrific guests, um, Dr. Daniela Louie and Dr. Shade Harris, uh, to talk about um, revitalization and transformation of policies and places. So as you all saw on um, the email I sent this morning, this is kind of the culmination of the first three webinars. Uh, you know, first part of the process uh, in, in safety strategies are typically uh, engaging the community. Um, you then, then build the partnerships and then you utilize data and research to really understand um, the, the wholeness of the challenges that you're trying to address. And, you know, as you have this team in place, you have the data to kind of understand um, some of the, the specific challenges that you want to address. This then becomes the prime opportunity to think about revitalization and transformation of policies, uh, trainings, uh, and places in your community that you can uh, move towards. And it's, this is also a sustainability component to improve youth safety and the school climate. Um, and this is gonna help young people uh, feel safer at school. Um, it's also gonna help their well being. Um, so we're gonna talk to you about ways that you can uh, utilize your planning team and community stakeholders and, and think about ways to improve these policies and practices and make sustainable changes in your community. Um, just a, a few technical notes. Um, there is a chat feature and a question and answer. So if you have questions during the course of the presentation, feel free to uh, put them in there and we will make sure that we address those. Uh, and the, the training is being recorded. So if you have folks on your planning team um, that weren't able to attend today, and I know that a lot of the schools, um, you all are, are dealing with um, you know, I, the, the concept of, of transitioning again from remote to back in person schools. Uh, I know I just got a notice that our elementary schools are going to be going full time March 23rd, and that was just uh, about a week ago. So that should be interesting for the schools to handle. So I'm sure you all are balancing a number of things. So I appreciate you guys um, uh, joining this webinar. And again, for those that were not able to make it, this is going to be recorded. We'll put it on base camp uh, so that you all can share this with your your planning team. Um, uh, you know, if they're not able to attend. So let's see if I can switch this. Uh, here we go. Oh, nope, wrong one. There we go. Um, first, uh, the, the the early part of the these slide decks are, are going to look familiar. Um, again, we want to thank the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention for the opportunity to uh, host this webinar um, and uh, their continued leadership with this grant program. Um, again, similar to the, the prior convenings, we're gonna talk about the goals for the webinar. Um, we'll introduce the panel, the panel will provide their presentations and then we'll have a moderated question and answer uh, at the back end of this. Um, so today's webinar, uh, Again, revitalization and transformation of policies and practices. That's a mouthful, um, but this is really to help sites to think about, you know, using all of what we've put together, the team that we've put together, um, how can we create sustainable changes and look at what has been, um, you know, policies and protocols or training programs that we've had in schools, you know, to try to understand if they're working, if they're not working. Um, to determine where some young people don't feel safe or why they don't feel safe in schools. So we're going to kind of help provide the, the framework to be able to map that out, to look at, you know, kind of the theory of what these policies and programs and places are supposed to be versus what is actually happening uh, in, in your school community. Um, we're also going to talk about how to use it. This is a lot of also organizational change, um, you know, changing the way organizations interact with one another and, um, uh, you know, address the challenges, address a common, common challenge. Uh, let's see, we're going to 
switch to um, again. This is part of our uh, the the um, the four core elements of our TTA strategy. Um, you know, as as you pull together this team, we're going to identify physical environmental safety linkages. We're going to look at school policies. Um, it's also a great opportunity to look at trainings uh, in the schools and in the community, and review juvenile contact policies. So at the end of the session, you know, hopefully we will be able to help you all be able to connect findings from data analysis to support revisions to school safety practices and procedures um, to improve student educational outcomes, school safety, and the school climate. Um, we want to help you think about how do you use um, all the elements that you have put together um, to think about ways to break patterns of trauma and offending. Um, you know, how do we hold offenders accountable? How do we also hold our schools accountable? Um, and lastly, um, you know, think about, you know, the example that you can be provided is one specific example that, that uh, occurred in Richmond Public Schools, but how can you utilize the lessons from that um, process to think about juvenile justice policies and protocols, um, to think about how they impact schools, how they impact the community, and most importantly, how they impact uh, students, families, and caregivers. So with that, um, I want to turn it over to our wonderful presenters. Um, first, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Daniela Louie. Um, prior to joining LISC, she served as the Executive Director of the Virginia Children's Cabinet, um, where she aligned interagency resources policies and programs to make sure that um, Virginia's most vulnerable children and families can thrive. Um, she worked across four secretariats, 19 state agencies, and 150 programs to create sustainable cross-sector partnerships that connected local communities to state supports. Um, we're totally thrilled to have her on LISC's team, where she is the director. Uh, for the social determinants of health, where she addresses educational inequalities, health disparities, and income inequality through research, policy, and practice. So, welcome, Daniela. Great. Thank you so much, James. Um, and good afternoon to all of you. So, I'm just going to kind of set Shade up for her story. She's really the, the main show here, but kind of give you some of the context of where this presentation and project fit within, hopefully, um, the work that you guys are doing as well. So you can click to the next slide, James. So um, as James mentioned, the project that we're going to describe right now, it happened in 2017-18 um, during the final year of Governor Terry McAuliffe's administration in Virginia. And as James also mentioned, so under his leadership, Governor McAuliffe created a governor's children's cap, um, cabinet. And my understanding is that you guys learned a little bit more about that from Dr. Lynn Sachs at a previous webinar. Um, but for those of you who didn't have a chance to hear about it, um, just a two second refresher is that it's really a collective ed, um, impact entity where all of the child serving agencies come together under the leadership of their relevant um, secretaries. So Secretary of Education, Secretary of Health and Human Services, Secretary of Commerce and Trade, Secretary of Public Safety, the First Lady at the time who oversaw nutrition, and the Lieutenant Governor, who's now the governor, who focused on early childhood. So as James mentioned, I had the privilege of being the executive director at the time. But during the second year of the administration, the Center for Public Integrity, they found that Virginia was among the worst in the nation for school referrals to law enforcement. And while we re later realized that actually it was a bit of a reporting error on the way that um, schools were reporting those referrals, it really brought to light the racial disparities and the inequities in our Virginia school systems and juvenile justice systems and to sort of the highest, um, both publicly and to the highest level of the government. So in response, we launched an initiative that was called the Classrooms Not Courtrooms, and it was designed to address the school to prison pipeline. So while some of the efforts of that initiative were really sort of state policy um, focused, we also had a real close eye to the local government, local context, and grassroots improvements that could be made at the time. So the, at the time, and as part of this local focus, the superintendent at the time of Richmond Public Schools approached the children's cabinet, and he had a concern about students who were placed on home-based education 
um, after they're being charged with a crime that happened in the community. So next slide. So to address this specific issue in Richmond Public Schools, we actually brought on Dr. Shade Thomas Harris to lead this area. And Shade's position was really interestingly situated because we had her sort of liaising and leading across all three entities. So the governor's office at the children's cabinet level, um, the initiative at the juvenile justice level, and then at Richmond Public Schools. And so this context was obviously very helpful, right? The political context, the support from the senior leadership and this unique role, but really wanna sort of stress that while it was helpful, it wasn't essential. And so we hope that by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to see how the process that um, Sade employed could actually be used in any kind of context. So we don't want you to think that it could only be done because of this unique situation at the time. So next slide. And again, the story, the case study that's gonna be showed is really about tier three, right? And so it's going to be about the personalized academic and wraparound supports for justice involved students. However, over the course of the presentation, so next slide, you're gonna learn about a community hub model where Sade took the lessons from that tier three intervention and was able to apply it to the entire school and all students. So again, if you sort of hear the story from the tier three, know that we're gonna have a sort of full school um, picture by the end. Next slide. And so with that, I'm excited to introduce Sade Harris. Um, so this is also really fun because as you can see, 2018, I think is the last time we got to formally work together. So it's very fun to be together again for this webinar. So Dr. Harris serves as the Chief Engagement Officer. So she leads the vision development and strategy for the community, uh, family community engagement throughout the Richmond Public School. Her and her team are responsible for developing and nurturing partnerships with key stakeholders at the local, state, and national level to advance the division's strategic plan called Dreams for RPS. She's originally from Springfield, Mass, and has been an educator her whole career. She's a phenomenal leader, community organizer, visionary, storyteller that I'm sure you'll see soon, friend and colleague. So with that, I'm going to turn it all over to Sade. So you can take it from here. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, good to be with all of you today. Um, at the time when I was embarking on this work, I was just a doctoral student. Um, I was not from Richmond, as Daniela said, I was from um, Springfield, Massachusetts. So this was my first time coming um, down south, coming to Virginia. Um, and one of the things that made this um, work really special is although I was in between three organizations, it was really important that we focused on one thing. And so often when you are faced with so much, it's really easy to take on too much. Um, but we just started with like one policy um, and through the work with um, the Department of Juvenile Justice and looking at the, the practices and policies, um, we, we focus on one locality in Richmond and then one specific policy. Um, and here you will see per VA code, um, just to give you some context, one of the things we realized is when students in Richmond committed any one of these reportable offenses, that information was going directly to the school. Now, if you go to the next slide, you'll see what the division had in place is a policy when they received the notification of these charges, because they were severe charges per code, they were putting students immediately on home-based education. Um, so that was something that was almost becoming automatic, and that was the RPS's policy. So we looked at this one specific policy, and I'm gonna walk you through some of what we did. So in that policy, as I shared, they were placed on home-based education. So what's that? Home paced education is when students receive five to 10 hours of instruction per week. After doing a deep dive, sometimes we, we found out it was much less than that. Um, because they were at home, they had little access to no access to peer groups and um, positive adult relationships or wraparound supports. They were unable to participate in extracurricular activities, and they were left isolated and unsupervised without an opportunity um, and had 
the opportunity instead of learning more so to engage in um, further delinquent behavior, right? Um, so you had a policy that was almost perpetuating violence that could continue to happen in the community on so, some levels because the students were at home for a large chunk of time. So one of the first things that I did um, was to make what was invisible visible. And this is something as you guys are working in your different localities that I find is extremely helpful is just to do a visual map. And I come from an education background, fourth grade teacher, then was a principal. So you'll see a lot of primary colors here, but I am a visual person. So you can look at data, you can look at all these things, but I was in an environment that was new to me. And I'm like, how am I gonna engage with people in conversations about what's happening and pull out a spreadsheet? No, no one wanted to see that. Um, people wanted to see and know the stories of what was happening. And this was a great, great visual way for me to tell that story of how a young person here moved through the justice system as well as the school system at the same time. And you can see those little red circles. Those were like decision points because I wanted to flag that all throughout this process, there are different decisions that are made that lead to the perpetuation um, to perpetuating, excuse me, um, students who are getting further and further in the system. And then I was able to map it on the school side too. Like what are those decision making places as well? And this was so powerful. They used to call me like the girl with the map because I would go everywhere in the community and just put this out here and then engage in conversations and facilitate conversations. And I didn't have to do anything else um, but listen to people. And that's what I did. I listened to those who were most impacted by these policies, which were students, families, community members. Next slide. So as a result of this, um, after mapping, and this was my doctoral work, I needed to, I wanted to equip myself with the right knowledge so I could really dig deep into it. So I asked three kind of essential questions. One was, what do we know about adolescent development as it relates to justice involved youth? Two, what would a trauma informed approach look like for justice involved youth? So you saw the map I just showed you. If we had a more trauma informed approach, what would that look like? How would that alter the map? And then three, what processes or approaches are necessary to build cross sector relationships and facilitate new learning for the Richmond City community, relevant stakeholders, so we could best support these students. Now, the reason why number three was so important is because you can dig deep in the knowledge, but if you don't have something that specifically speaks to organizational development, you're gonna have this knowledge, but people aren't necessarily gonna know how to work together. So I knew I needed to dive deep into adolescent development trauma, but I also needed to get dig just as deep on as an organization how do you work across sectors? The Justice Department, the school department, social services, we were dealing with the same families and no one was talking to each other. So question three was really important on how we were gonna work across agencies. Next slide. So as a result of that, I had a theory of action. Um, if we understand how adolescent development and trauma affect justice involved youth, and we determine key ways to build relationship and collaborate across sectors, then we will be able to lead and guide meaningful conversations about how the district's policies, programs, and practices are or not supporting students and then share research about how to best support these students and so that our district and our community can make the necessary mindset shifts as well as policy and program improvements so we could better support these students. Next slide. So that was kind of like my working theory of action. This is me. I did all these animations. <laughs> this is me in the pink dress surrounded by the community because it was a group effort. I honestly did so much listening in this process and as a result put together a cross sector justice collaborative where we could look at this one policy but everyone was at the table and we were able to kind of work through these things together. And as a result of that, there are three kind of lessons um, and things that were really pivotal and allowing us to, in a very short time, 
um, be able to transition from these students being on home base to putting them in a program that we designed called the Aspire Academy that instantly allowed them to get um, more access to positive um, role models and teachers and enrichment activities and instruction um, based on an existing model that was there, but we were able to use it for these students. And all of that, I would say, was um, as a result of these three P's I'm gonna talk to you about, which will be super helpful as you think about how does this apply to like the larger system. The first one was position. Um, I was uniquely situated um, between three organizations, but more importantly, I was able to bring those three organizations together and they really once at the table kind of did the work. I was just kind of facilitating, but that positionality of us all being together across sector was key. Next slide. Secondly was um, public value. So we were different people had reasons why this policy kind of resonated for them. Some people really talked about students being in the community, being a public safety risk. Other people, the instruction piece really resonated with them. Like, how are these kids not getting more instruction? So for different people, people diff had different value propositions. So I had to kind of figure out what that was for different stakeholders and create this kind of shared public value so that we, we could reimagine what this could look like. And then that led to us creating the Aspire Academy. Like I said, had increased technology, instruction for these students, and they had more connection to both youth and wraparound services. And that was a result of that um, school justice collaborative and us really bringing everyone to the table. But again, you can't get everyone to the table in a meaningful way if people don't understand why it's so important to be there. Because anyone can attend a meeting, right? But really to have people understand like, okay, this is this is relevant to me because of what? Right and creating that shared sense of value was really important and the third one, um, the third P was proximity. Um, um, there is a saying that says. Um, Brian Stevenson, who wrote, if you may have seen the movie Just Mercy or read the book, which is amazing, but he talks a lot about proximity and he says. Um, you have to get proximate to the people you're trying to serve. And our, and our ability as leaders to get close or get proximate to the people we want to serve is going to give us all the information. And I would argue so much of the answers already lies with the people most impacted. We just kind of have to step back and do some really deep listening. Um, and as a result of getting proximate, that's what I did. Um, I listened, I learned, and was able to reimagine with the community a more resilience enhanced model. So again, um, that first graphic, this is like the, the remix, the second version, where we said, okay, what if the first point of contact, instead of being law enforcement, was really community, and we reinvest resources into health, mental health, employment, engagement opportunities. And then we think about how can we be preventative with Richmond Public Public schools before we even think about home base, um, home based education. And now you can see all these students moving through again, lots of primary colors and characters, um, but moving through this system. But you see opportunities for diversion. You see opportunities to kind of re-engage with the educational system. And you, home based education is until the very, 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 very like bottom. We're not even like mentioning that, right? Because we really want to um, reimagine this path. So proximity was really, really important. And then um, next slide, some of the implications of our work. And again, at this time I, I was a student was we were able to rethink that policy. We put a real focus on prevention and intervention. And then we used Dr. Karen's map dual capacity um, building framework, which basically says you have to build your cap capacity at the same time you're building family capacity. And we use that to really think about um, how do we create really authentic engagement. Um, now, as a result of that, I kind of like left RPS with that. I was going back to Massachusetts, um, but ended up really falling in love with Richmond, um, with the communities. 
Um, and at that time, um, the superintendent was looking for our hiring a new senior team and asked me to stay on as chief engagement officer. So it, it was one thing to provide recommendations. Now I'm a part of the system. So I was actually able to do similar to what I'm sharing with you is, you know, how did I use those same steps I talked about and now apply it to the larger division? And one of the major things that helped us do that was the creation of these community hubs because what we were able to do and what we noticed by listening to people i took that same approach as okay what do i need to know about trauma informed um care what do i need to know about adolescent development and um now looking at richmond as a division what are some of the things that we need and we recognize that what we were missing was an infrastructure to really get proximate to the community um so we knew we needed something not necessarily in the schools but in the community because in our division there was a huge lack of trust between the schools and the community and having people situated in the community credible messengers allowed us to buffer that trust from the community back to the school. So we created these community hubs in different regions of the city and we looked at data. So the East End may need more family liaisons than the North side, right? So we did it all based on also what our data was telling us, um, but took a community oriented approach and listening to what the community felt was important, especially as we think about um, minimizing the amount of time students were spending out of school for discipline related um, infractions. Um, and we use that to build partnerships and really start to um, antagonize, um, interrogate, excuse me, policies um, in our system. But the community hubs really allowed us that kind of fr that um, foundation so we could have a stronger presence in the community. So that's where we started. Um, and that work. Next slide. And lastly, this is just some of the new positions. It took a lot of money um, to, to add capacity with hub coordinators and family liaisons, but that's kind of where we really focused our work. Like in order to do this, um, we knew we had to have more capacity in the community um, so that we could reach families, we could listen to families and really begin to start to do this, the work, which we knew would spur kind of revitalization and transformation. So with that, um, I'm going to end there. Um, again, we have a lot more work to do, but I think using kind of, you know, our position, um, our proximity um, and creating that shared kind of public value around the, the, the issues that are really affecting um, our students um, is, is what we are working every day to do. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Daniela and I think we're going to take some questions. All right, and before we ask questions, um, can you just talk a little bit more about some of the stark differences that you found, particularly on that map of juvenile justice and education and the timeframes of how education thought, oh, you'll be out for like a week and the juvenile process was longer and maybe even some of the outcomes that were happening prior to this project um, because of that, like how long kids were out of school and things like that. Sure, so the first cohort of students who were on home-based education, when we did a deep dive, um, some of the students had been out anywhere from six months to a year and a half, right? So it varied depending on the, on the students. And um, although when we did that mapping, we saw the different decision-making processes, but layered on top of that was like the time frame, right? So getting the notice of a student who may have been charged, um, we found different breakdowns in the system of sometimes that happened right away. Um, sometimes if someone didn't see that email for a while, it may have been longer, right? So we really had to do a complete kind of like audit of the timeframes of each of those steps. Um, and it boiled down to communication. Um, so the School Justice Collaborative was really helpful 
um, to understand, um, you know, where was some of this breakdown happening in terms of information? And some of it was they were reaching out to the wrong person who was the point person in the division, right? Other things were just a misunderstanding are not really understanding how the justice system works and knowing that these um, a hearing could take a longer amount of time. So it really varied, um, which is why that mapping was so important and then layering the timing on that mapping. Um, and that allowed people to see the disconnect, especially as it relates to when um, students may have been waiting for a court date, like that could take a very long time. Um, and that was just something that I think some of the division personnel just didn't have a, a true understanding of, but also spoke on the justice system side, how long things were taking and if there was any way for that to be expedited as well. So I think both systems saw the flaws within the systems, but without that communication, they were again both working in silos. So that collaborative at least allowed us around one policy allowed us to start talking through those things. Thank you so much. That's fantastic. No, I appreciate that. I don't want to pepper questions because I don't know who from the community or James before I start asking anything. Um, should we open it up? Is it are people asking verbally? Or are they putting things in the chat? And James, do you have any questions to start? Thank you. Yeah, so, so first of all, I would just say first, I love the presentation, Shade. I think that was great. I know I've gotten a couple of comments about um your map that they're really interested in seeing so just so folks know i'll make sure that uh we share the presentation so you guys can see that um that is great and i just i think you know when 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 we were talking prior to the webinar you know i think that was something that i was hoping that all the sites could really take away is that you know to being able to talk about certain challenges is one thing but to map it out and to you know, present it in black and white where you can see the different decision points and how that impacts schools, the community, the young people, that's super important. So thank you very much for that. Um, and secondly, if, if folks have questions, um, feel free to put them in the Q&A or the chat. Uh, I think there may be even a raise hand feature, so you can try that as well. Um, or uh, uh, I think you all can unmute yourselves too if you want, so feel free to pop in. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask before um, other folks jump in was about the the trauma informed practices for the schools. Like, what? How? How did? It, it, you know, how did? How did you determine? Like, you know, what what types of trauma informed uh, trainings you're going to provide? Was it was it also for the schools? Maybe even for law enforcement agencies? And you know, how did that impact the work? Great. So. For the actual, like during my doctoral work, it was really just kind of led, um, was there for, to be informative for our school justice collaborative, right? So it was that, how can I put some knowledge on the table around these things? And then with this, how can we operate that through that lens as we're thinking about how to address that specific problem? So it really was almost like this, this lens in which we saw everything through and my role was bringing to that that to the table and my role now as chief engagement officer um, again listening to the community what we heard from the community was all about how do you move to more a restorative justice division right and what does that look like and what does that look like what does that sound like um, so one of the things that we did as a division um, was made sure our senior leadership and started there were really aware about trauma informed practices and did training at the director level. And this was something that our division just named as a priority. Um, so a lot of that wasn't necessarily as a result of my work. We had been talking about it, um, but the division under the leadership of Superintendent Cameras was already going in that direction. I think um, projects and examples like this further kind of like, you know, um, made it clear why having a trauma informed approach was so important. Uh, uh, important um, and I was able to share this example, but it was something that the division and the school board adopted and then we, we rolled out these things, um, you know, from a director level and slowly but surely started to build it into our professional development for teachers and leaders. That's great. That's great. And then 1 more question, Danielle, then I'll give it to you and I'll, we'll open it up to. Um, 
one of the, the focus points for this grant program is to bring community based agencies into the schools. But one of the things I found really interesting when talking with you is about the community hub model was that it was almost like, you know, there, there needed to be a first step. And the first step was bringing us and our agencies into the community and to develop that trust and build that trust. And then we'll be able to better able to get the community based organizations, families, the critical partners to the schools. So talk about um, talk about that, that the process that went into that decision. Um, and then, you know, how do school uh, administrators, staff, and who, who in the school participates in the community hub? And the same question for, you know, other are there, are there juvenile justice agencies or law enforcement agencies, and, you know, what is their participation in this? Perfect. Um, sure. So, you know, to be, be completely transparent, um, I think it's really important to know where you sit as it relates to the community. Right. So I knew very clearly um, I am um, in, in Richmond sense. Right. I was an outsider a little bit. I wasn't from Richmond. And that's really important. Um, and I think it's really important for people to know what they to really recognize how you show up in the community. And I think, you know, race, identity, all that plays into it. And those are all things that I thought about as I engaged in the um, in this community work. Um, and the reality was I needed to find credible messengers in the community who really, who could not only um, share their feedback because they had been doing this work long before me. They may not have just had some access to some of the spaces I was in as a newcomer, but in terms of the work and knowing and having a pulse on the community, they were there. It's about finding them. It's about listening to them. Um, and then it's about kind of like empowering them in different ways. So being able to find credible messengers in the community and forge partnerships with, they gave me credibility in the community, right? So they're like, no, she's good, <laughs> right? And that took me going to meeting after meeting, just listening you know, giving access um, in terms of following up with them right away. But I would really don't underestimate um, really building time and thinking about who are people who already have leverage and then how do you really, um, how can you be intentional about those relationships and, and really start to think about those who are maybe even doing the work, but may need additional capacity, right? So they may be credible, but they need support with their data collection and all of that. So we were able to kind of mutually help each other. Um, but that was something that really, really helped. So when we went to thinking about this as a division, we knew that like, look, we don't have a lot of people in the community um, and we know there's a history with trust. So we were able to really spend a lot of our budget because again, it helped having a superintendent who was like, look, engagement is a focus of ours. And we added family liaisons um, to our budget who were going to, we were going to hire members of the community, you know, basically hiring some of those credible messengers and have them a part of our RPS family. And that has proved um, really tremendous um, um, for our division. So that was one of the reasons I think you can sometimes there are times where you're inside the system. Sometimes it's really powerful to be outside the system pushing in. Um, so we kind of use both of those. Um, but again, doing that listening work, that empathy work, it was really helpful to, to, to align yourself to people who already have a lot of credibility in those communities. Thank you. Thanks, Shade. All right, and I lied. We were going to toss it to the community, but I have one more question. In the thinking about, I thought it was interesting when you said, you know, it was so important to focus on one single policy and really break it down. And that was during the, you know, the project came from the, from RPS superintendent, and it was your focus for your doctoral work. Now you, like many of the folks who are listening, there's like a million possible yes. competing priorities. How do you, or do you still feel like you need to drill into one at a time, or how do you sort of prioritize what to look at, um, just knowing that there are so many needs? 
Yes, great question. So as many of you know, and especially if you're like me, I just came back from maternity leave. I had a, a little boy, Blue Nathaniel Harris, um, about four months ago. So this is like my first week back to work. And I was like, wow, this is a lot to come back to. Um, and so I think that's a great question because when sometimes when everything seems like it's on fire or it's important, how do you pick one? And I think that's where our strategic plan came into place. One of the first things that we did um, in my role when I came on was to listen to the community and try to identify what were their priorities. Our priorities should be their priorities. And I think Richmond didn't have a strategic plan since 2013. So having been able to like take all of that feedback from the community and put really clear priorities and come up with five key priorities, that kind of led us as a division. Then from those priorities, we were really able to say, one, anything we do should line up with that. But from that, what are the really key things we want to focus on? Now, again, you're always going to have that urgent call, but at least our kind of big rocks were one aligned to something larger in the division priorities. And two, we really looked at our data to find out where are we going to see the most kind of, um, where are we gonna see the most results um, from our focus areas? Um, a lot of times people spend maybe 80% of their time on, on the things that may only get them, you know, 20% of the results, right? Where we wanted to make sure how can we really spend a lot of our time um, on the things that are going to really help us see this movement. Um, and again, following that same process, um, of, of listening to the community, the data and research um, allowed us to really key into a couple of things, one of them being this kind of new community hub structure. Thank you. And so now I will really open it up to everybody else um, who's listening. And again, I feel like it can be questions about the actual work in Richmond, the community hubs, or if you have your own sort of problem of practice in your community that you'd like some of the insights from um, Shade, please feel free to ask as well. And I'll pause before continuing to pepper thoughts. Yeah, so something just came in. Can you share more about how youth slash students were engaged as part of your community listen sessions? Um, so when I first started, like I, the one of the largest groups I spent time with were the students who were actually on home based education and so often we think about okay let's dive into what are the policy recommendations, but we don't listen to the people who've actually been impacted. Um, so spending time um, and they probably got so annoyed at seeing me, but I would go to the court hearings, um, call families, I shadowed um, probation officers on their routes. Um, and really try to just listen to the stories of, of students um, and use kind of qualitative data. And one of the things that was really powerful that I did was I kind of created, I'm really big on storytelling, and I created these videos of students just sharing their experience. And it was some of the most powerful kind of data that I had. Um, so that when I went back to the children's cabinet, when I went into these spaces where those students were not or those families were not, I actually had them with me. Um, so that is such a powerful piece I would encourage is how can you be deliberate about bringing those voices into the rooms where they may not have access or where they historically may have been um, not allowed to be in or systems of systemic racism um, bar them from having access, right? So those are the things that, you know, we thought about, but then it's like, no, I can still bring them. Um, so my whole presentation for my dissertation was literally telling the stories of like students and family. So constantly just thinking when I can bring their voices in, but a lot of interviewing and story um, narrative videos really allowed me um, to, to bring their experiences into the work. Great, any other questions from sites? And if you need to be unmuted, let me know. I don't know if it automatically mutes you. 
Um, and while while folks are letting me know about that, um, Shade, um, how so? So I, I know when we were talking prior to the webinar again, um, it, it was focused within one school. I believe, I believe it was one school that you were working with in the Richmond Public Schools, and you know originally you had used the data to determine that this policy was most having the greatest impact on ninth grade students, and then as the the work continued you realized that hey this is something that can be useful for all of our high school students in in the schools so how did how did you first determine it was you know the the, the focus could should be in ninth grade um and then how did you utilize the team to then expand it and you know is richmond public schools thinking about you know what is the lessons learned and, and how are they taking um you know what has been created with aspire you know, are they making it bigger? Are they sustaining it? And and you know, how are they using the information that 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 uh, uh, that you guys have learned? Yeah. So it was a actually a little bit different, um, James. So the all the students this policy affected division wide. So the the practice was happening across all the schools. Um, Richmond currently already had a program where they were servicing students who were over age and under credited. Um, but after kind of doing kind of like an asset analysis of the division, we realized this program was underutilized. So we figured we could use kind of spaces in this program, an existing program for this subset of students. Now, when starting something similar to like starting with one policy, we knew we needed to buy buy-in and starting this with, you know, the whole ninth through 12th grade. Um, would have been really hard for oh. to get full buy in. So what we did is we started with just ninth graders. So ninth graders um, who were being affected by this policy, what would that do if we started transitioning them to another form of way of just maintaining them closer to us, getting more instruction and all of those things. By doing that with ninth graders, that's why in our my theory of action, it talks about mindset shifts. A lot of this was about mindsets, right? There were lots of stereotypes about these students. And I know you guys can relate um, when working with this population of students that people come with kind of preconceived notions about these students. But once we started with ninth grade, and, and had more interactions with these students, um, people saw like, you know, why aren't we doing this more? Like, are these students aren't what they I thought they would be, right? So it allowed us to do some of that mindset um, work as well as address some biases um, with, uh, with our educators and our staff. And then we were able to roll it out. So then, and remember I was a student, so I, I technically didn't have any formal authority, right? I'm putting stuff in front of people, but it really had to be done at that pace. So the division could buy into it and begin to change. And at the end of it, it was like this policy is something that one, the school board needs to look at. And we need to think about just how do we expand it to 12th grade, which they did um, and continue to do um, to answer your question. And in now being on the other side of it, we still need a lot of work on on how we're working with students and being preventative for those kind of justice involved students um, that requires a lot of work. Um, but this is, um, I think, laying the foundation of being able to do it. Definitely this this was a great step in the right direction. Great, thank you. When Another question I have, or it's more of a statement, having gotten the chance to observe you when you were in that role, was the same attention that you gave to getting the students' voices and families' voices and community incorporated. You did a really good job building relationships across these different agencies very intentionally. And when thinking about this project and the folks that are listening, their role as a project coordinator, whatever it might be, that is, my understanding, potentially slightly neutral, what advice would you have on how to build the institutional support? Because they may not have contacts in these different agencies where you didn't really either. So any thoughts on how you built the agency support in concert with the community side? Yeah, so two words, humble inquiry, right? Yes. So that is what I would suggest to everyone, humble inquiry. So, and what that means is just, I'm coming with a very like, you know, um, um, I'm coming 
with a, a, a spirit of kind of trying to just understand, but humbling myself enough to know, because, you know, I, I definitely had thoughts about things. Like when I saw some of the way things are working, I'm like, oh my goodness, right? But like knowing I can't come into with that with agencies. Um, and so having a little bit of grace um, and, and being humble in that respect, but then really just asking questions. And I found for the most part, people really like to talk about their organization, but they also like to talk about the kind of issues they were having. And more times than not, those issues were the same issues one agency was having, having the other agency was having, having, but just weren't talking, or there was kind of like this history of tension we had to break down that had nothing to do with the work, right? Nothing to do with the work. So I think being able to go in with that spirit of grace and um, and really kind of taking the, that out of it to really um, ask meaningful questions and, and um, have this kind of like spirit of generosity in terms of like even people who came off kind of hard towards me and just had to kind of, you know, take a minute, breathe, and then, but still kind of ask them or get to know them and build the relationship. Um, it may have not happened in the first conversation, but they let me in the second one. And then the second one, we were able to get at it. But it, I can't stress enough building relationships with those agencies um, and, and um, humility and grace goes a long way. Thanks, Henry. Looks like we have also, another. Oh, okay, oh, go ahead. Sorry. You got it? No, no, you go. I didn't see the, there's another question. Yeah, um, they, uh, the question was with the community hub model, um, you know, you can open yourselves up for demand for community priorities that might be different than what you quote the, the school, I guess the school had anticipated. Um, you might all, I guess that could also translate into, you know, policies or protocols or things like that. Did that happen in Richmond and where you had to shift your priorities to align with those of the residents or the community? Yes, absolutely. When we started, I remember when I first was hired and my my boss was like, the first thing you're going to do is the strategic plan. And we had about like six or seven months and we had 172 community meetings and there was no office of engagement. It was me and a UVA intern. And um, we put together a plan to engage um, the entire community. Um, and we had over 172 meetings. And the way we were thinking about the strategic plan was totally different than what we ended up with. And I think that's exactly because of that. Like we listened and made changes constantly after hearing community feedback. And I think one of the things, if you wanna do that authentically, you can't go in with this kind of already pre-made plan because people will just automatically see the, um, the inauthentic um, kind of um, position that you got, that they're taking, or it just won't feel authentic. Um, and we have to be really careful about that. And sometimes people say they want community feedback, but when they get it, they're like, no, 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 we already had a plan. So it, it required us to change our plan quite frequently. Um, and I think that was important because again, it helped us build trust in the community. Um, so we did have times where we definitely um, made some large pivots because of community feedback and other times where we recognized maybe a lot of the feedback we were receiving wasn't representative of the entire community, but maybe those who had more access to either um, platform or privilege. And we had to also interrogate that too. Like, who are we hearing from? Um, and make sure those voices that we weren't hearing from were at the table, which really led us to the community hub model because we needed to reach a whole a whole subset of families who, you know, because of childcare and other things aren't, aren't making it to a, a public comment session, right? Um, or so we, we had to do a lot of advocacy and intentionally build advocacy into our office. So I have like a full time person whose role is like government relations, government relationships and literally writing policy and advocating for policy at the legislative level. So knowing that that's actually an in house role, not like an external lobbyist, but that's someone full time that we need to have embedded in the system so that we can advocate for the policies that really are going to allow us to do the work is super important. That's great. Thank you. 
anyone else have any questions? And if not, everybody's going to get a half hour of their legs back, I guess. All right, y'all are quiet today. <laughs> Must be a Monday. <laughs> or else it's uh, sunny and everybody, oh no, at least it's sunny over here. And y'all want to get outside. Um, all right, well, I guess with that, um, thank you so much, Chade. Thank you so much, Daniela. Um, like I said, I will post the, um, the, the recording. And uh, if you guys have any questions, um, let me know. And Shade, I'm going to also ask maybe offline too about the um, family liaison positions because I think those are amazing. Um, and you know, if there's like a job position that you can share for others that might be thinking about that, I mean, that might be something that um, they could think about uh, putting in place as well. So I would be happy to share any resources. Also. Um... Um, James, feel free to share my email. It's sharris1 at rvaschools.net. Um, but um, James can share that with anyone. And I'm, I know how this work can be. And if you need a thought partner or if there's any way I can support you, don't hesitate to reach out. All right. <clears throat> Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, everyone. Catch you all later. Take care. Bye.